Okay, this structure is similar to example two, with the exception that we have a cantilever end at E and we have a moment applied to that cantilever. We also have an upwards pointing point load uh, between B and C at point F. So that's going to mix things up a little bit in terms of our distribution, but that's absolutely fine. We just have to follow the same rules and procedures that we've established so far. So we'll go straight on and work out our stiffnesses. So if you're working along with this question, if you haven't yet tried it, um, go ahead and try and work out your stiffnesses yourself first before you watch me do it. So assuming that you've done that, we can say that the stiffness KAB for member AB is going to be a four EI over L because we are we are fixed at point A and continuous over the support at B. So KAB is four EI over the length of eight meters, which is 0.5 EI. And KBC will be the same. It's going to be four EI over the span, in this case, six meters, and that's going to be 0.67. EI. Now the stiffness for CD is going to be 3 EI over L because at C the structure is continuous over the support giving it a rotational resistance but at D it does fly over the support but it's just a cantilever it's not connecting the structure is not connecting to anything at E and so there's no rotational resistance provided inherently in the structure and so we've got 3 EI over L which is going to be 3 over 4 which is not 0.75 EI. Now the stiffness of DE is not required because there will be no moment transmitted into DE. We can determine what the moment at D is at the very outset of the question and that will not change. So moving forward to look at our distribution factors. This is the usual procedure now, the distribution factor for BA. I won't go through the long hand now. We will just say that it is not 0.43 And the distribution factor for DC, the left hand side of that cantilever is going to be one. And that's always the case with a cantilever because the distribution factor for the actual cantilever itself, DE, will always be zero. Because as I said, we never distribute moment into the cantilever. So now we can look at our fixed end moments. Well, we have a UDL acting on a fixed, fixed structure. This is after we have fixed the joint at B. And so we have a fixed, fixed structure. And we know at this stage, we've seen enough examples that the fixed end moment in that case for AB is going to be minus WL squared over 12, which we can work out to be minus 53.3 kilonewton meters. Similarly, the fixed end moment on the far side for BA will be the positive version. So these are the reaction moments that would develop at those fixed supports. Now we can look in a little bit more depth at the fixed end moment for member BC. So in this case, the fixed end moments will be the opposite sense to what you're used to seeing, because in this case, the load is pointing up. Uh, the 75 kilonewtons is acting upwards. And remember, these fixed end moments are the reaction moments that would develop at those supports B and C in response to the loading. And so in this case, those reaction moments would in fact go the opposite to the way that we're used to seeing them. And so we can say that the fixed end moment for BC is in fact clockwise now, and so it's a positive. And we've seen the formula for this before. It's going to be P times, let me see, A, where that is A and that is B, times A, so that's going to be 2, times B squared, which is 4 squared, all over L squared, where L is the total length, which is 6. So that's going to be 66.7 kilonewton meters and the fixed end moment for CB is going to be 75 times B which was 4 times A squared which is 2 squared over 6 squared which is minus 33.3 kilonewton meters. 
Okay, and then the last one we'll consider, again, we'll look at this in a bit of detail, is CD. So this is going to be, the, the fixed end moment for CD is going to be based on a propped cantilever model. And that is always the case when we have a cantilever, let's say to the right here. So that's D. And we know for the structure, there's a cantilever there. And if there's a cantilever there, the fixed end moments on the adjacent span are always going to be determined based on a propped cantilever model, which is what you're seeing me draw here. So the fixed end moment for CD is a minus WL squared over eight for the propped cantilever, which will be minus 10. Okay, and obviously the fixed end moment for the far side is zero because it's a pin. DC is zero. Okay, we can quickly consider the cantilever net, the cantilever moment. Cantilever moment. The fixed end moment is going to be the reaction moment. F E M D E equal to minus 50. Okay, then. So we can now go ahead and work on our distribution. Okay, so balancing up joint B first, the out of balance moment is 120, and so we need to balance that with a minus 120. So 43% of that will be minus 51.6, and on the far side, minus 68.4. Join our balancing joint C, we have a 43.3, a positive 43.3 required. So that will mean, that will mean 20.35 on the left and 22.95 on the right and then balancing up the cantilever well the negative 50 at DE must be balanced by a positive 50 and the distribution factor is 1 uh, for, for DC and so that full 50 goes in to balancing the cantilever on the left hand side of the support. So that's your plus 50. Now we can carry over our carryover moments. Now balancing up joint B again, we have, we're going to have a negative 4.38, a negative 5.8, then on this side we have 4.32, and 4.88. Remember the cantilever got balanced at the start and then it's left well alone. Carrying over. So balancing out again, we are going to have a negative 0.93 and a minus 1.23 plus 1.36 and a plus 1 plus 1. 0.54. Okay, and now at this point we evaluate and we say, well, joints are all balanced now. If I do another round of carryovers, we're going to un unbalance the joints, but the amount by which we're unbalancing them is really negligibly small, and so we won't bother going to do another carryover. We've reduced things sufficiently at this point. And so we can sum up the moments in each column to arrive at the final moments for each joint. So that's a negative 81.29 a negative 3.61, a positive 3.61, negative 44.37, and a positive 44.37. And then our cantilever is balanced out, plus 50, minus 50, and plus 50. Okay, worth at this point just noting down what way, whether there's tension on the top or bottom of each of those joints. So the negative 81.29, that's a an anti-clockwise moment applied to the left-hand end of a structure. So that's like saying a negative moment, a negative anti-clockwise moment applied to the left-hand end of a structure, which would induce tension on the top. A negative 3.61 applied to the right-hand side of a structure is a moment like this, which will induce tension on the bottom. And doing that same mental exercise each way across, we would work out that that's also tension on the bottom, and that's tension on the top. 
Okay, so we are back at our process now of analyzing free body diagrams. So once again, like I said in the last example, that the, the important thing for you to be able to do here is to carry this through from the distribution table all the way to your final shear force and bending moment diagrams. So I'm, as I said before, I strongly urge you to go ahead and do that for yourself. First of all, if you have any problems, come back and watch the rest of this video. So now I'm going to process the free body diagrams in turn and flesh out the, the, the remainder of the analysis. Okay, so looking at these, so these are my free body diagrams and I'm looking at member AB first. And so VBL is equal to 29.39 kilonewtons. And that acts up. Okay, taking some of the forces in the y direction. And VA is equal to 50.61 kilonewtons. Again, in the direction assumed. So following exactly what we've seen previously, the max moment and so M1 is equal to 46.78 kilonewton meters and that is in the orientation that I have drawn it which would induce tension on the bottom of the structure. All right, then moving on to BC. And so VCL is equal to 31.79. Again, that's in the direction assumed, and I assumed that it was going to act downwards, which is correct, and that is a positive, will be a positive shear according to our deformation sign convention. Now we can take the sum of the forces in the y direction. And so VBR is equal to 43.21 kilonewtons. Again, in the direction assumed, which was down. Which on this side of the structure, a downward acting shear force would be a negative shear force. Okay, let's cut underneath the point load. So cut at F to determine what the bending moment is there. And so MF is equal to 82.81 kilonewton meters. Okay, and again, that would induce in that orientation tension on the top of the structure. So we can go ahead and cut member CD. And so VDL is equal to 33.59 kilonewtons up. Taking the sum of the forces in the y direction. And VCR is equal to 13.59 kilonewtons. Again, acting down. All right. Now we know enough to be able to summarize our solution with our, our structural diagram indicating our reactions and our shear force and bending moment diagram. Okay, so now we have the complete the complete summary of our solution. So you will, at this stage, I, I, I certainly hope you have worked out how to go from the end of your distribution table down to this complete 
summary solution. So you should understand the the relationship between the loading on the structure and the shape of the of the shear force diagram because we're only determining shear forces in in these last three examples we've done we've only been determining shear forces at discrete locations and so that relies on you having the knowledge of how the shear force diagram varies between those discrete locations and that how it changes or how the shear force diagram varies is depending on the type of loading on the structure. And then similarly, when we know the shape of our shear force diagram, we can use that to help us determine the shape of the bending moment diagram between the discrete locations that we've already determined the bending moment. So we make our cuts in our structure um, and we determine span moments and the moment distribution has given us the moments that supports. But we need to have some knowledge about how the bending moment will vary between those discrete locations. And that's back to more fundamental knowledge on shear force and bending moment diagrams, which I've I've done I've also done a course on, which if you're if you're fuzzy on, you should maybe consider taking a look at that course. Okay, but as far as uh, as far as using the moment distribution method to analyze statically indeterminate beam structures, I think we've more or less covered off everything that we can. You've seen the different types of uh, loading that we can apply, how that plays out. We've seen how to deal with cantilever ends, how to deal with pinned ends. Um, and what, what they introduce into the distribution process. So you should at this stage, if you've managed to do those three worked examples, you should be more or less well equipped to tackle any statically indeterminate beam. Um, so now we are going to draw a line under beams and move on to applying this method to structural frames.